You're listening to Policy Currents, a weekly podcast from RAND. I'm Evan Banks. And I'm Deanna Lee. Every Friday, we bring you new insights from RAND's latest research and commentary. It's September 20th. Across Lebanon on Tuesday, thousands of pagers used by members of the Iran-backed terrorist group Hezbollah exploded simultaneously. This was followed by a second wave of explosions involving walkie-talkies. The attacks killed at least 37 people and wounded thousands of others. Israel has not claimed responsibility, but is widely believed to be behind the sabotage devices. And on Friday, just before we began recording, Israel's military announced it had struck Beirut for the first time since July, reportedly targeting a senior Hezbollah commander. And Hezbollah now appears to be responding by launching rockets into northern Israel. Rand's Raphael Cohen discussed the exploding wireless devices earlier this week, before the exchanges today, along the Lebanese-Israeli border. On a purely technical and tactical level, this is a pretty stunning level of sophistication, Cohen said of the blasts. From a military operations standpoint, he continued, it's hard to see how you could do much better than having Hezbollah pagers blowing up in Hezbollah operatives' hands. Violence between Israel and Hezbollah has increased in recent months. Today is far from the first time the two sides exchanged strikes. Cohen said that Israel likely doesn't see the status quo as sustainable, so this week's attacks using devices are likely an attempt to get Hezbollah to back down. It's unclear whether this will work, and all eyes are on how Hezbollah's response will continue to unfold. The group's leadership doesn't want to look weak, Cohen said, but it also doesn't want an all-out war. Cohen noted that even if Hezbollah were to respond militarily, as it now seems to be doing, the two sides could seek to tamp down the risk of escalation through back-channel negotiations. One in six K-12 teachers works in a school district that has been touched by gun violence in recent years. To prepare for school shootings and other acts of violence, many schools have implemented active shooter and lockdown drills. What do educators think about these exercises and about school safety in general? The results of a new RAND survey provide some insights. Teachers are split on whether participation in drills makes them feel more prepared to respond to active shooter incidents. Slightly less than half said that drills make them feel more prepared, and half perceive drills as having no impact on preparedness. A slight majority of teachers, 54%, reported that drills make students feel more prepared to respond to active shooter incidents. 69% of teachers said that participating in active shooter drills has no impact on their perception of safety at school. And only one-fifth said that drills make them feel safer. In the 2023-2024 school year, a greater share of female teachers than male teachers 27% versus 14% respectively, reported fear of being harmed or attacked at school. In the previous year, female teachers were no more likely than male teachers to report such fears. And overall, teachers reported more concern in the 2023-2024 school year about being victims of an attack at their schools and were even more concerned for their students than in the previous school year. So, while safety drills do not appear to be lowering teachers' perceptions of preparedness, drills are also not raising these perceptions as much as one might expect, given their frequency and ubiquity. Further, many teachers don't believe these drills are improving safety at school. This suggests that more work is needed to understand the impact of drills on staff and students, and what schools can do to better support their well-being. In 1969, a series of missteps and miscommunications led China and the Soviet Union to the precipice of nuclear war. According to a recent RAND paper, this crisis offers key lessons for today's U.S. military planners, particularly related to growing concerns that a conflict could break out in the Taiwan Strait. 
As decision makers in Washington consider how a hypothetical war between the United States and China might unfold, they will need to account for the same confusion that brought China and the Soviet Union to the brink more than 50 years ago. In other words, they should remember that leaders may not know how their actions will be received by the other side. In fact, history holds many examples when one side did not receive the actions of the other as intended. That's why the United States, quote, needs a clear vision of how it can win a war with China without catastrophic escalation, says Rand's Jacob Heim, lead author of the paper. The best option may be denying China any prospect of victory from the very start of a conflict. And although this approach faces severe and growing challenges, the U.S. still has some key advantages. Its submarines and long-range missiles, for example, could make an invasion of Taiwan prohibitively dangerous for China. Whatever the vision for victory is, America needs to immediately start investing in the capabilities necessary to make that vision successful. Since they will be the senior leaders of tomorrow, young officers especially need to think through their options if deterrence and diplomacy ever fail and the United States and China go to war. This will be a new experience for most. The U.S. has not had to seriously consider theories of victory against a nuclear-armed adversary for several decades now. Veterans who are issued other than honorable discharges, or OTH discharges, are often left with little or no access to VA benefits. These veterans face significant challenges. For example, they have higher rates of anxiety, depression, PTSD, traumatic brain injury, alcohol misuse, and cannabis misuse. Further, the risks of homelessness and suicide among veterans who received OTH discharges are more than double those of veterans who are discharged honorably. What might be done to enhance care for these vulnerable veterans and ensure they don't fall through the cracks? A new RAND paper provides recommendations for Congress and VA. Addressing potential bias in discharge characterizations, for example, might help. Commanders have discretion in assigning OTH discharges. So it's possible that this approach is driving disparities in discharge characterization among units in the same service, service branches, and racial or ethnic groups. To minimize this, the Pentagon could provide more guidance or criteria to help determine how service members are discharged. For instance, there could be a list of specific circumstances in which OTH discharges are warranted, which would prompt commanders to document their rationales if they depart from this guidance. This could help standardize the assignment of discharges across the services. Our researchers also encourage having a panel, counselor, or reviewer examine the paperwork for a service member who receives an OTH discharge, This would help ensure that the information is accurate. Another recommendation is to increase services available to those with OTH discharges, which could help this population with social connections, mental and physical health care, employment and education, and financial security. Overall, increased access to services from veteran organizations could provide more effective, efficient, and specialized counseling to veterans as they transition to civilian life. It is important to note, however, that because discharging less than honorably is stigmatized, these veterans might be reticent to seek out such services. That's it for this week's episode. If you'd like to learn more about what we discussed today, check out the show notes at rand.org slash podcast. RAND is a nonprofit institution that helps improve policy and decision making through research and analysis.